Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. The names have been changed to protect the innocent. Dragnet is brought to you by Chesterfield, made by Liggett and Myers, first major tobacco company to bring you a complete line of quality cigarettes. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned a homicide detail. The body of an attractive woman has been found in a downtown office building, beaten to death with a piece of lead pipe. The killer has escaped into the city. Your job, find him. Today, friends, you hear these three words everywhere. Chesterfields for me. The Chesterfield you smoke today is the best cigarette ever made. Best for you. Because Chesterfield gives you proof of highest quality, low nicotine. The taste you want. The mildness you want. Chesterfield is best for you because it is tested and approved by 30 years of scientific tobacco research. Chesterfield is best for you because it has an established good record with smokers, proven by test after test. Yes, friends, the Chesterfield you smoke today is the best cigarette ever made. For the taste you want, the mildness you want, join the thousands now changing to Chesterfield. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Thursday, April 15th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out a homicide detail. My partner's Frank Smith. The boss is Captain Lorman. My name's Friday. We just left the murder room, and it was 7.40 a.m. when we got to suite 718, the building manager's office. <laughs> Miss Joyce? Yes? Are you men cops? Yes, ma'am. We understand you're the one who found the body, is that right? Oh, that's right. I found her. Oh, it's an awful thing. This is my partner, Frank Smith. My name's Friday. I wonder if you feel up to telling us exactly what happened. Oh, sure. It's about the most terrible thing ever happened to me. something we can get you, ma'am? Oh, no, thanks. Janie brought me some hot coffee. Who's Janie? Janie Alquist. She works the first three floors. She brought me some hot coffee. I see. She was up here, and they let her bring it. All right, Miss Joyce. Could you just tell us about it, please? Look, right from the beginning. You want to hear all about the whole thing? If you would, please. Well, I came on at four, just like always. I punched in and came up to the 10th floor and started in. Got the things out of the closet on the 10th. Mm -hmm. Usually I start on the 7th, but now and then I like to do it a little different and I start on 10 and work down. Yes, ma'am. What time was it when you found the body? Oh, just a few minutes ago. I guess about 7, right around in there. I only had two more offices to do and I'd be finished. I just had two more when I got there. Yes, ma'am. Could you go ahead and tell us about finding the body? Oh, well, I unlocked the door, and I saw the light inside. I thought it was kind of funny, because usually it's dark. You mean in the office? Yes, and where Mrs. Fitzgerald's desk is, it's usually dark. Yes, ma'am. I thought it was kind of funny, like I said. But then I thought that maybe she was working. Mm -hmm. She does accounting, you know, woman accountant, and I thought she was working. Mm -hmm. So I knocked. I didn't just want to go right in if she was working, you know, disturb her. So I knocked, mm -hmm. but she didn't answer. Right, go ahead, please. Well, I opened the door and went in. Right off, I was kind of sore about it. No excuse for a thing like that. No excuse at all. What do you mean? Well, didn't you see the place? Didn't you look? Yeah. Well, then you know what a mess it was. Papers all over the floor, and ashtrays spilled, all that mess, and I'm supposed to be through at 7.30. Why, I'd never have made it, never got through on time. <laughs> and that's when I saw her behind the desk. Oh, it was an awful thing. There she was on the floor, dead. Yes, ma'am. There was no one else in the office? No. Just Mrs. Fitzgerald. She was on the floor behind the desk. Well, what'd you do then? Oh, I screamed. Loud. 
shout as loud as I could. I wanted somebody to come up there right away. And that was the first time I ever saw anybody dead. Then I ran out of the office and went downstairs to get somebody to help. Just an awful thing. Oh, poor Mrs. Fitzgerald. Oh, she was so nice. All the time saying hello when she'd come in early and I'd still be working. Oh, I think about it and I just can't believe that it's true. I just can't hardly believe it. Did you see anyone on the floor while you were working? Just Mrs. Fitzgerald. No, ma'am. I mean, was there anybody in the halls of the building? Oh, no. No, not that I saw. There wasn't anybody. I'd have seen them if they were there, but they weren't. All right, Miss Joyce. We'll contact you tomorrow about a statement. Meantime, I'll leave you one of our cards here. If you think of anything we should know, we'd appreciate it if you give us a call. Oh, I sure will. Anything at all, I think of, I'll call you. Hmm. Here I go now. Yes, ma'am. I've got to go home and take a hot bath and calm my nerves. Surely. Oh, it sure is going to be a shock to her husband. Of course, not that he'll mind too much. I beg your pardon? Her husband, you know, Mr. Fitzgerald. Yes, ma'am. What about him? Well, just that it isn't going to bother that one too much. Why do you say that? Oh, I shouldn't have said anything. Not a word. I shouldn't have told you. I'd get fired, sure. Well, if it's got anything to do with Miss Fitzgerald's death, maybe you better tell it, don't you think? Well, if you'll promise not to tell a supervisor. All right, go ahead. It gets dull just being in a big building by yourself, all alone at night when there isn't anybody around. It's pretty dull. Mm-hmm. Once in a while, not real often, but just once in a while, I kind of read some of the letters that people throw away, you know, in the wastebasket. Mm-hmm. They don't want them anymore, so when it gets real dull, I read them. And I've read some in Mrs. Fitzgerald's office from her husband, Mr. Fitzgerald. Yeah. Seems like they've been having some kind of a big fight, going to court and all. I don't know what it's all about, but they've been fighting. And in the letters, he tells how she ought to leave him alone. I guess she's asking for a lot of alimony or something. That's what it sounded like to me. Some of the letters, the way he wrote to her, mean, used to threaten her all the time. You saw these letters where he threatened her, did you? Yes. One, I guess it was about a week ago, he said in that, if she tried to railroad the thing through, now that's what he said, railroad the thing through, he'd come up here and... Yes, go ahead. Well, that's all there is. I couldn't find the other piece of the letter where he said what he was going to do. See, she tore up the letters after she read them. Mm-hmm. All right, Miss Joyce, thank you very much. No, I hope I helped. Yes, ma'am, I certainly have. I sure wish I could have found that other piece of the letter. No way of knowing what it said. Yes, ma'am. You suppose he really meant it? I don't know. We'll ask him. By the time Frank and I had arrived at the scene, the crew from the crime lab was there. Photographs of the entire room were taken, and fingerprints were lifted from the edges of the desk, from the top of a lamp, and from the molding around the door. The murder weapon, a 15-inch section of heavy lead pipe, was booked for evidence. There was nothing we could tell from the pipe itself other than the fact that it was the murder instrument was a plain piece of three-quarter inch pipe. One end was wrapped in a heavy brown paper. The other was blood-stained. Because of the appearance of the office, it looked as if robbery was the motive for the crime. However, on examination of the victim's personal effects, we found that two large diamond rings were still on her fingers. In her purse, we found cash in the amount of $226. On the desk itself, we found a woman's wristwatch set with 12 diamonds. The fact that none of this had been removed apparently ruled out robbery as the motive. The other employees of the building were questioned, but they were unable to shed any light on a possible suspect. None of them had seen any unauthorized persons in the place after closing hours. People on the street in the immediate vicinity were questioned. The only lead we were able to come up with was that at approximately 7.02 a.m., a newsboy had seen a short, stocky man walk from the office building entrance. Other than the brief description of the man's build, the witness was unable to tell us anything. An immediate broadcast was gotten out on what information we had. From a telephone book in the victim's desk, we got an address for her husband, Oscar Fitzgerald. It was a men's club located in downtown Los Angeles. Frank and I drove over to talk to him. Come in. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sit down. I'll call for some coffee. You fellas want some? No, no, thank you. No, sir. You don't mind if I have some? No, you go right ahead. Room service, please. Kind of early for the cops to come calling, isn't it? Yes, sir. I guess it is. Uh, This is Mr. Fitzgerald, room 417. Would you please send up a pot of coffee? That's right. Oh, and uh, send a large glass of orange juice, too, huh? Yeah, make sure it's cold. 417. Right. 
thing I can't go is warm orange juice. Like cigarette? Yeah, thank you. Now, what's this all about? What do you want to see me for? Well, when's the last time you saw your wife? Ada? Thank you. I guess a couple of weeks ago. Why? Well, can you narrow that down to a day? Why? Any special reason for me to? Well, we'd like to hear it. Well, let's see. I guess it was around March 30th. I can check it if it's important. Where'd you see her? At my lawyer's. We had a conference to try and work out the divorce and settlement. What line of work are you in, Fitzgerald? I think you'd better tell me what this is all about before I answer any more questions. If this is some sort of trick Ada's trying, you tell her it won't work and she can get off my back. No, it's no trick. I think it might be better if you cooperate with us and answer the questions. All right, but I'm going to tell you going in that if you try to pull a fast one, I'm going to deny everything I tell you now. If you tell us the truth, you won't have any trouble. Now, where do you work? Right now, I'm between. Well, what's that mean exactly? Well, I'm an actor right now. I haven't got an assignment. Where'd you work last? Picture studio. Look, until you tell me what this is for, I'm not going to give you any names. Can you give us your movements for the past few days? Starting when? Well, let's try the day before yesterday. Okay, I got up and went out to see my agent. Of course, that was a waste of time. Hung around the office for a couple hours and then had lunch on the strip. After that, I came downtown, saw a movie. I came home, took a shower, and I kept the dinner engagement. You prove that? If I have to, yeah. But you get no names until I know what's going on. All right, how about yesterday? What'd you do then? I got up and went out to my agents. He told me he had a part on the fire. We went out on an interview. I was at the studio until about 4.30, and then we went back to my agent's office and had a couple of drinks. After that, I came back here. It didn't feel too good, and I went to bed. Well, the man at the desk would be able to verify all that, would he? Yeah, just ask him. Fitzgerald, how'd you get along with your wife? Well, it's not any of your business, but I'll tell you. It isn't any secret. I hated everything about it. You ever have any fights with her? Not more than five a week for the past four years. You ever hit her? You know, people win money for answering questions on quiz shows. What happens if I answer the big one? Well, that depends on how you're going to answer it. We understand you wrote your wife some threatening letters now, is that right? I guess you could call them that, yeah. I told her to get off my back and leave me alone. Told her if she didn't, she was building more trouble than she could handle. You ever threaten her life? No. I'm not going to try to tell you that there weren't times when I could have killed Ada. There were a lot of them, but it wasn't worth it, not for her. What'd you argue about mostly? The divorce. I've been trying to get one for the last four years. Ada wouldn't see it. Finally, when I did talk her into it, the settlement she wanted was way out of line. I wouldn't go for it and told her so. What's all this about the fights and the threatening, anyway? Something happened to Ada, is that it? Yes, sir. She been hurt? Fred is more serious than that. She dead? Yes, sir. You think I did it? Now we're checking everybody that knew her. Okay, I told her there were times when I could have, when I maybe wanted to, but I wouldn't go to jail for her. Not ever. You gotta find another boy, and when you do, I'll go as lawyers for you. Yeah. How'd they do it? Piece of lead pipe. Bad? Yeah. Rough way to go. Is there an easy way? We made a preliminary search of the room, but we found nothing that would tie in the victim's husband, Oscar Fitzgerald, with the crime. We talked to the desk clerk, and he verified the man's story that he'd been in his apartment the evening of the killing. Fitzgerald made arrangements with us to attend the coroner's inquest, and Frank and I went back to the city hall. We checked with the crime lab on their investigation. Lieutenant Lee Jones told us that they'd been able to lift several partial fingerprints from the murder weapon, but that they were impossible to classify. He went on to say that the other prints that had been found at the scene were unusable as evidence, since it would be difficult to get enough points for identification. The other physical evidence taken from the office was of little use. A check had been made of the piece of pipe, but it was found to be of a common type and impossible to trace. Microphotographs had been made of the serrated edges, and these had been booked as evidence. We asked the stats office to make a run on the M.O. of the crime, and they told us that they would start through their files immediately. For the next two days, Frank and I talked to all of the friends and relatives of the victim, attempting to find a motive for the crime. From what we had to work on, the only plausible reason for the killing was either revenge or jealousy. None of Mrs. Fitzgerald's friends or business acquaintances were able to point out anyone with a strong enough reason to kill the woman. Monday, April 19th, Frank and I got back to the office after interviewing one of the victim's business competitors. Well, that's another one that didn't go anyplace. You know, it seems like that's all we've been drawing on this one, doesn't it? Yeah. I'll check the book. All right. Anything come in from the stats office yet? No. Said they'd have the rest to run for us this afternoon. Well, first punch didn't turn anything. I got it. Homicide, Friday. Yeah, Jack. Anything on him? Sure. <laughs> We're no place now. Well, well no, anything's got to be... You want to give me that address? All right. All right, we'll check it. Good. All right, Jack. Thanks again. Bye. This is Jack McCready. Says he talked to one of his informants this morning. Guy came up with a couple of good things, maybe. Yeah? 
One of them's about a guy in the Olympia bar at 4th and Kohler. Fellow's pretty drunk, been doing a lot of talking down there. Something for us? Maybe. He's bragging about beating a woman to death with a piece of pipe. p.m. We left the office and drove over to the corner of 4th and Kohler, the Olympia Bar. When we walked in, there were only a few customers in the place. At the far end of the bar, a short, stocky man was sitting alone. In front of him was an empty shot glass and a bottle of beer. He appeared to be pretty drunk, and as we entered, he was talking to the other people seated at the bar. Any of you guys that don't believe it, you just come outside with me, I'll show you. I'll show you all, every one of you. Bartender, I got an empty glass. Now, let's do something about it, huh? I need a drink. I think you had about enough of that, don't you? What? I said you had enough to drink. Who are you to tell me that, huh? Who are you to come in here and tell me what to do? What's the matter? You think you're cops or something, huh? Is that what you think? You called it. Come on, we want to talk to you. You mean you are cops? That's right. Well, listen, you better get out of here and do it fast if you know what's good for you. You just better. Frank, yeah. Take your hands off me. You guys don't hear good, do you? Stand still. You come messing around with me, you're going to find out. You'll find out good. I'll give you the same thing I gave her, the same thing. Hold it, Frank. All right, come on, mister. Who are you talking about? I'll tell you. I'll tell you good. Then you'll know leave me alone if you know what's good for you. I'm talking about that Ada Fitzgerald. That's who. Ada. You go messing with me and you'll get what she got. I'm a pretty rough fella, you know. Pretty rough. Is that right? You bet you. You're not dealing with a kid, you know. Well, that makes it even then, doesn't it? Huh? You're not dealing with a woman. We took the suspect down to the homicide squad room. He identified himself as Carl Neely. He was handcuffed to a chair, and we ran his name through the record bureau. He had a long string of arrests for various charges, including attempted robbery, assault, and assault with intent to do great bodily harm. He'd never been convicted on a felony, but his record showed that he'd served two terms in the county jail for drunk charges and creating a public nuisance. While we were checking his record, the suspect passed out in an alcoholic stupor in the squad room. We contacted Sergeant Jack McCready and Officer Danny Galindo and asked them to make a search of the suspect's residence. In going over the place, they'd found a blood-stained shirt and a coat. The garments were packed in a cardboard box that had been hidden under the kitchen sink. They were brought downtown to us along with an empty envelope found in the apartment. It had been sent to the suspect, Neely, and the return address on the back indicated that the letter had been sent by the victim's husband, Oscar Fitzgerald. We waited for the suspect to come to enough for us to question him. Frank went out and brought back some hot coffee. We tried to get Neely to drink some of it. 8.40 p.m. It's got hot. All right, come on, try some more. Your cops, huh? You've been the route before. Yeah. What am I here for? I want to talk to you about the Fitzgerald woman. Ada? Mm, spouting off again. You said you killed her. Figures. <laughs> Every time I get tanked up, I always kill somebody. It never fails. All right, tell us about the Fitzgerald woman. <sighs> Nothing to tell. I read about it in the papers. This morning I started drinking. It always happens when I've been belting the booze. I right away tell people I killed somebody. These clothes here belong to you? Let me see. I don't know. Where'd you get them? Are they yours? I don't know. You got that many clothes? Hmm? I know all the clothes I got. No trouble at all. Yeah, you don't dress as good as me. All right, come off it, Neely. You're in trouble. Big trouble here. You sat in the bar this morning, told everybody about how you'd beaten a woman to death. We find these clothes in your apartment, blood stains all over them. Here's another thing, this envelope. Where'd you get this? Through the mail, like it says. You see the stamp? You know Oscar Fitzgerald? I don't get mail from strangers. Sure, I know him. Is it a crime to get a letter now? What was in that envelope? I don't think that's none of your business. Well, we do. What kind of dealings have you got with Oscar Fitzgerald? Well, you used to work for him. Doing what? I took care of the place when him and Ada were married. Sort of a general handyman. When'd you see him last? I don't know. Maybe a couple of months ago, around there. A couple, three months. And what do you find so important that he wrote you about it? Look, he loaned me some money. He sent me a check. It was a loan, huh? Yeah. Sign any sort of note for the money? Well, I endorsed the check. It said on it it was a loan. What are you guys trying to prove, anyway? You trying to tie me in with Ada's killing? You look good for it. Oh, you're off your rocker. I had nothing to do with it. Sure, you got me for drunk, but that's all. Your record makes you look good for it. 
clothes we found in your apartment don't help you. You sure Oscar Fitzgerald didn't pay you to kill his wife? It'd be a lot better if you told us the truth here, Neely. I'm telling you the truth. It's right in front of you. All you got to do is open your eyes. It's there. Where'd the bloodstains come from? They're mine. Well, tell us about it. Well, I got in a fight with another fellow. Where? A bar down on 7th. When? Wednesday. Last week? Yeah, last Wednesday. What time did you have this fight? Closing time. That'd make it about 2 o'clock, huh? That's when the bar's closed. Where'd you go after you had the fight? Went up to a friend's house and had a couple more drinks. Who's a friend? You don't know him. He's got no record. What's his name? I don't want him dragged into anything. What's his name? Jackie Meadows. Let me see your hands, Neely. Sure. You got some pretty bad bruises there. You must have hit something pretty hard. Mm -hmm. Fight I told you about. That's where those came from. Tell us what you did after you left the bar. I told you, I went up to Jackie's. I had a couple of drinks. What time did you get there? Around 3, maybe 3.10. What time did you leave? About 5. Where'd you go? I don't remember too good. I was pretty boozed up. Where do you think you went? Well, Jackie was worried about me being cut up from the fight. He wanted me to see a doctor. Yeah. He drove me down to Georgia Street Receiving Hospital. Yeah. I was there until 9.30 Thursday morning. <laughs> are listening to Dragnet, the authentic story of your police force in action. World altitude records. World speed records. All part of Bill Bridgman's job as a supersonic test pilot for Douglas Aircraft. You read about Bill in Time magazine. Now let's meet one of the world's fastest humans and Jacqueline Hazard, who is collaborating with Bill on his new book, Test Pilot. They smoke America's most popular two-way cigarette, Chesterfield. I smoke the king size. After hearing what the Chesterfield people have been saying about them, I thought I should try them. I'm convinced they're best for me. It's Chesterfields for me, too, but I like the regular size. Either way, they're everything Bill says, and they're really mild. You try Chesterfield. I think you'll find they're best for you. Yes, for the taste you want, the mildness you want. Join the thousands now changing to Chesterfield. The call was put through to Dr. Hall at Georgia Street Receiving Hospital asking if a patient was given emergency treatment on the morning of Thursday, April 15th. A search of the hospital records verified the story told to us by the suspect, Carl Neely. We checked through our crime reports and we found that a miscellaneous injury report had been made. From the coroner's report, we knew that the victim had been murdered between the hours of 5 a.m. and 7 a.m. on that morning. We got in touch with Neely's friend, Jackie Meadows, and he also verified the suspect's story. He was booked in at the main jail on a charge of being drunk in a public place, and Frank and I started checking out the remainder of the list that the stats office had given us. Originally, there had been 12 names on the list. We talked to 10 of them. The 11th, a Norman Sitkin had a record of burglary, attempted robbery, and assault with a deadly weapon. He'd been arrested and brought to trial on a charge of murder three years previously, but he'd been acquitted. The circumstances surrounding his arrest were the same as those in the Fitzgerald case. The main reason he'd been released a free man was the testimony of his mother, who had sworn that Sitkin had been home with her on the night of the killing. When we went out to his home, we found that he wasn't there. We talked to his mother, and she told us that he'd been in San Diego for the past three days. Under interrogation, we established the fact that on the night of the Fitzgerald killing, Sitkin hadn't been at home, but that he had been in Los Angeles. We put in a call to the San Diego authorities and talked to Lieutenant Mort Gear in the homicide detail. We contacted the hotel where he was staying in Los Angeles, and a 24-hour stakeout was placed on the location. Wednesday, April 21st, Frank and I got back from lunch. Better put in a call to Mort, huh? See if they got anything on Sitkin? Yeah. You want to do it? Right. Okay. Hi, this is Frank Smith, robbery. Yeah, I'd like to put in the call of San Diego PD Homicide Bureau. Yeah, Lieutenant Morton Gear. No, it's a homicide. Yeah, DR-132-549. Yeah, that's the one. Mm -hmm. That's 3268? Huh? Well, 58. Right. Okay, Sam, thanks. I'm on this one, Joe. Oh, sorry. Homicide, Friday. Yes, sir? No, that's right. 
When was that? Yes, sir. Right away. Cancel that call, Frank. What do you got? Sitkin just walked into his hotel. Frank and I left the office immediately and drove out to Sitkin's hotel. We talked to the officers on stakeout, and they told us that the suspect had just returned. They went on to explain that they'd given Sitkin no reason to suspect that anything was wrong and that he'd gone directly to his room. Frank and I got in the elevator, and we went up to the fourth floor. Yeah? What do you want? You Norman Sitkin? Yeah, what do you want? Police officer. <laughs> Come on. You got no right to do this. Let me see your warrant. Get your coat, Sitkin. We want to talk to you. What for? What do you got to talk to me about? I got nothing to say. Get your coat. Why? What's the charge? What are you taking me in for? Suspicion of murder? <laughs> You're kidding. Well, you just keep thinking, man. You mean this is for real? Come on, let's go. Well, now, wait a minute. I want to know what this is all about. Is that so? Well, sure. Figure I had something to do with that woman who was beaten to death downtown. F Fitzgerald, I think that's the name, huh? Isn't that what you think? Well, you seem to know all about it. Well, you're way off on this one. I got an alibi that you can't break. I can see you guys figuring because I stood this kind of beef once before, you can make it stick this time. Well, it won't work, cop. None of it fits together. I can prove where I was that night every minute. All right. That's right, every minute. You check in my house. It happens I was with my mother, just like the other time. All night I was home. You're going to stand on that? Well, there isn't any other way. Well, it's going to make it a lot easier then. Well, what's that supposed to mean? We talked to your mother. She says you weren't home that night. Well, she's wrong. You let me talk to her. She'll tell you. You just let me talk to her. She's sure you weren't there. She's willing to testify to that. Get out of my way! All right, come on. Want to get the cuffs? Yeah. Hold still. Funny, isn't it? What's that? Well, it looks like he might have been good on that first killing. The one he was acquitted on. His mother might have lied on the stand. That's well, not going to make a lot of difference, is it? Huh? He's going to make up for it on this one. The story you have just heard is true. The names were changed to protect the innocent. On August 17th, trial was held in Department 97, Superior Court of the State of California, in and for the County of Los Angeles. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here is our star, Jack Webb. Thank you. Earlier, George Fenneman told you exactly why the Chesterfield you smoke today is the best cigarette ever made. And best for you. Now, the rest is up to you. Get a carton or two for yourself. Smoke them and you'll say as we do... It's Chesterfield's for me. Norman Edward Sitkin was tried and convicted for murder in the first degree. On recommendation of the jury, he received the maximum penalty. And on July 19th, he was executed in the lethal gas chamber at the state penitentiary, San Quentin, California. just heard Dragnet, a series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice comes from the office of Chief of Police W.H. Parker, Los Angeles Police Department. Technical advisors, Captain Jack Donahoe, Sergeant Marty Wynn, Sergeant Vance Brasher. Heard tonight were Ben Alexander, Virginia Gregg, Herb Ellis. Script by John Robinson. Music by Walter Schumann. Hal Gibney speaking. Watch an entirely different Dragnet case history each week on your local NBC television station. Please check your newspapers for the day and time. Chesterfield has brought you Dragnet, transcribed from Los Angeles. Filter tip smokers, this is it. L and M filters, the one filter tip cigarette with plenty of good taste. Much more flavor, much less nicotine, and effective filtration. Only the L&M filter contains the miracle product, Alpha Cellulose. Absolutely pure, non-mineral, harmless to health. Yes, this is it. As Helen Hayes puts it, L&M filters are just what the doctor ordered. Buy L&M filters, the light and mild smoke. Rocky Fortune, following John Cameron Swayze and the news on the NBC Radio Network. Mm.